Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone Part 3 Chapter 7 The Sorting Hat The door swung open at once. A tall, black-haired witch in emerald green. Robe stood there. She had a very stern face and Harry's first thought was that this was not someone to cross. The first years, Professor McGonagall, said Hagrid. Thank you, Hagrid. I will take them from here. She pulled the door wide. The entrance hall was so big you could have fit the whole of the Disley's house in it. The stone walls were lit. With flaming torches like the ones at Gringotts, the ceiling was too high to make out, and a magnificent marble staircase facing them led to the upper floors. They followed Professor McGonagall across the flagged stone floor. Harry could hear the drone of hundreds of voices from a doorway to the right. The rest of the school must already be here but Professor McGonagall showed the first years into a small, empty chamber off the hall. They crowded in, standing rather closer together than they would usually have done, peering about nervously. Welcome to Hogwarts, said Professor McGonagall. The start of term. Banquet will begin shortly but before you take your seats in the great hall, you will be sorted into your houses. The sorting is a very important ceremony because, while you are here, your house will be something like your family within Hogwarts. You will have classes with the rest of your house, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend free time in your house common room. The four houses are called Greyfinder, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Each house has its own noble history and each has produced outstanding witches and wizards. While you are at Hogwarts, your triumphs will earn your house points, while any rule-breaking will lose house points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points is awarded the House Cup, a great honor. I hope each of you will be a Credit to whichever house becomes yours. The sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in front of the rest of the school. I suggest you all smarten yourselves up as much as you can while you are waiting. Her eyes lingered for a moment on Neville's cloak, which was fastened under his left ear, and on Ron's smudged nose. Harry nervously tried to flatten his hair. I shall return when we are ready for you said Professor McGonagall. Please wait quietly. She left the chamber. Harry swallowed. How exactly do they sort us into houses, he asked Ron. Some sort of test, I think. Fred said it hurts a lot, but I think he was joking. Harry's heart gave a horrible jolt. A test? In front of the whole school? but he didn't know any magic yet what on earth would he have to do? He hadn't expected something like this the moment they arrived. He looked around anxiously and saw that everyone else looked terrified. Two. No one was talking much except Hermione Granger, who was whispering very fast about all the spells she'd learned and wondering which one she'd need. Harry tried hard not to listen to her. He'd never been more Nervous, never, not even when he'd had to take a school report home to the Disleys saying that he'd somehow turned his teacher's wig blue. He kept his eyes fixed on the door. Any second now, Professor McGonagall would come back and lead him to his doom. Then something happened that made him jump about a foot in the air. Several people behind him screamed. What the dash? He gasped. So did the people around him. About twenty ghosts had just streamed through the back wall. Pearly white and slightly transparent. They glided across the room talking to one another and hardly glancing. At the first years. They seemed to be arguing. What looked like a fat. Little monk was saying, forgive and forget, I say, we ought to give him. A second chance dash. My dear friar. Haven't we given Peeves all the chances he deserves? He gives us all a bad name and you know, 
he's not really even a ghost I. Say, what are you all doing here? A ghost wearing a ruff and tights had suddenly noticed the first years. Nobody answered. New students, said the fat friar, smiling around at them. About to be. Sorted, I suppose. A few people nodded mutely. Hope to see you in Hufflepuff, said the friar. My old house, you. No. Move along now, said a sharp voice. The sorting ceremony's about to. Start. Professor McGonagall had returned. One by one, the ghosts floated away. Through the opposite wall. Now, form a line, Professor McGonagall told the first years, and. Follow me. Feeling oddly as though his legs had turned to lead, Harry got into line. Behind a boy with sandy hair, with Ron behind him, and they walked out. Of the chamber, back across the hall, and through a pair of double doors. Into the great hall. Harry had never even imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was. Lit by thousands and thousands of candles that were floating in midair. Over four long tables, where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. Professor McGonagall led the first years up here, so that they came to a halt in a line facing the other students, with the teachers behind them. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, the Ghosts shone misty silver. Mainly to avoid all the staring eyes, Harry looked upward and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, it's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history. It was hard to believe there was a ceiling there at all, and that the Great Hall didn't simply open onto the heavens. Harry quickly looked down again as Professor McGonagall silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top of the stool she put a pointed wizard's hat. This hat was patched and frayed and extremely dirty. Aunt Petunia wouldn't have let it in the house. Maybe they had to try and get a rabbit out of it, Harry thought wildly. That seemed the sort of thing noticing that everyone in the hall was. Now staring at the hat, he stared at it, too. For a few seconds, there was complete silence. Then the hat twitched. A rip near the brim opened. Wide like a mouth and the hat began to sing. Oh, you may not think I'm pretty. But don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black. Your top hat's sleek and tall. For I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat. And I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head. The sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you. Where you ought to be. You might belong in Greyfinder. Where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring, nerve, and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff. Where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuff eyes are true and unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old raven claw. If you've a ready mind. Where those of wit and learning. Will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin. You'll make your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means. To achieve their ends. So put me on. Don't be afraid. And don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands though I have none. For I'm a thinking cap. The whole hall burst into applause as the hat finished its song. It bowed to each of the four tables and then became quite still again. So we've just got to try on the hat. Ron whispered to Harry. I'll kill Fred, he was going on about wrestling a troll. Harry smiled weakly. Yes, trying on the hat was a lot better than Having to do a spell, but he did wish they could have tried it on. Without everyone watching. The hat seemed to be asking rather a lot. 
Harry didn't feel brave or quick-witted or any of it at the moment. If only the hat had mentioned a house for people who felt a bit queasy. That would have been the one for him. Professor McGonagall now stepped forward holding a long roll of parchment. When I call your name, you will put on the hat and sit on the stool to be sorted, she said. Abbott, Hannah. A pink-faced girl with blonde pigtails stumbled out of line, put on the hat, which fell right down over her eyes, and sat down. A moment's pause. Hufflepuff, shouted the hat. The table on the right cheered and clapped as Hannah went to sit down at the Hufflepuff table. Harry saw the ghost of the fat friar waving merrily at her. Bones, Susan. Hufflepuff, shouted the hat again, and Susan scuttled off to sit next to Hannah. Boot, Terry. Ravenclaw. The table second from the left clapped this time, several Ravenclaws stood up to shake hands with Terry as he joined them. Brocklehurst, Mandy went to Ravenclaw too, but Brown, Lavender, became the first new Gryffindor, and the table on the far left exploded. With cheers, Harry could see Ron's twin brother's cat calling. Bulls trode, Millicent then became a Slytherin. Perhaps it was Harry's imagination, after all he'd heard about Slytherin, but he thought they Looked like an unpleasant lot. He was starting to feel definitely sick. Now. He remembered being picked for teams during gym at his old school. He had always been last to be chosen, not because he was no good, but. Because no one wanted Dudley to think they liked him. Finch Fletchley, Justin. Hufflepuff. Sometimes, Harry noticed, the hat shouted out the house at once, but it. Others it took a little while to decide. Finnegan, Seamus, the sandy-haired boy next to Harry in the line, sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him a Gryffindor. Granger, Hermione. Hermione almost ran to the stool and jammed the hat eagerly on her head. Gryffindor, shouted the hat. Ron groaned. A horrible thought struck Harry as horrible thoughts always do when you're very nervous. What if he wasn't chosen at all? What if he just sat there with the hat over his eyes for ages, until Professor McGonagall jerked it off his head and said there had obviously been a mistake and he'd better get back on the train? When Neville Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toad, was called, he fell over on his way to the stool. The hat took a long time to decide. With Neville. When it finally shouted, Gryffindor, Neville ran off. Still wearing it, and had to jog back amid gales of laughter to give it. To McDougal, Morag. Malfoy swaggered forward when his name was called and got his wish it. Once, the hat had barely touched his head when it screamed, Slytherin. Malfoy went to join his friends Crab and Goyle, looking pleased with himself. There weren't many people left now. Moon not Parkinson then a pair of twin girls, Paddle and Paddle then Perks, Sally Ann and then, at last Potter, Harry. As Harry stepped forward, whispers suddenly broke out like little hissing fires all over the hall. Potter, did she say? The Harry Potter. The last thing Harry saw before the hat dropped over his eyes was the hall full of people craning to get a good look at him. Next second he was looking at the black inside of the hat. He waited. Hmm, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult. Very difficult. Plenty. Of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent, eh my goodness. Yes and a nice thirst to prove yourself, now that's interesting. So where shall I put you? Harry gripped the edges of the stool and thought, not Slytherin, not. Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh, said the small voice. Are you sure? You could be. Great, you know, it's all here in your head, and Slytherin will help you. 
On the way to greatness, no doubt about that no? Well, if you're sure. Better be Greyfinder. Harry heard the hat shout the last word to the whole hall. He took off. The hat and walked shakily toward the Greyfinder table. He was so. Relieved to have been chosen and not put in Slytherin, he hardly noticed. That he was getting the loudest cheer yet. Percy the Prefect got up and. Shook his hand vigorously, while the Weasley twins yelled, We got. Potter. We got Potter. Harry sat down opposite the ghost in the rough. He'd seen earlier. The ghost patted his arm, giving Harry the sudden. Horrible feeling he'd just plunged it into a bucket of ice-cold water. He could see the high table properly now. At the end nearest him sat. Hagrid, who caught his eye and gave him the thumbs up. Harry grinned. Back. And there, in the center of the high table, in a large gold chair. Sat Albus Dumbledore. Harry recognized him at once from the card he'd. Gotten out of the chocolate frog on the train. Dumbledore's silver hair. Was the only thing in the whole hall that shone as brightly as the. Ghosts. Harry spotted Professor Quirtel, too, the nervous young man. From the leaky cauldron. He was looking very peculiar in a large purple. Turban. And now there were only three people left to be sorted. Thomas, Dean. A black boy even taller than Ron, joined Harry at the Greyfinder table. Turpin, Lisa, became a Ravenclaw and then it was Ron's turn. He was. Pale green by now. Harry crossed his fingers under the table and a. Second later the hat had shouted, Greyfinder. Harry clapped loudly with the rest as Ron collapsed into the chair next. To him. Well done, Ron, excellent said Percy Weasley pompously across Harry. As Zabani, Blaze, was made a Slytherin. Professor McGonagall rolled up her scroll and took the sorting hat away. Harry looked down at his empty gold plate. He had only just realized how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasties seemed ages ago. Albus Dumbledore had gotten to his feet. He was beaming at the students. His arms opened wide as if nothing could have pleased him more than to see them all there. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are, nitwit. Blubber. Oddment. Tweak. Thank you. He sat back down. Everybody clapped and cheered. Harry didn't know. Whether to laugh or not. Is he a bit mad? He asked Percy uncertainly. Mad? Said Percy airily. He's a genius. Best wizard in the world. But. He is a bit mad, yes. Potatoes, Harry. Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with. Food. He had never seen so many things he liked to eat on one table. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops and lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, fries, Yorkshire pudding, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup, and, for some strange reason, peppermint. Humbugs. The Disleys had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything except the peppermints and began to eat. It was all delicious. That does look good, said the ghost in the rough sadly, watching Harry cut up his steak. Can't you dash? I haven't eaten for nearly four hundred years, said the ghost. I don't need to of course, but one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Sir Nicholas de Mimsey Porpington at your service. Resident Ghost of Greyfinder Tower. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brothers told me about you. 
You're nearly headless Nick. I would prefer you to call me Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Dash the ghost began. Stiffly, but sandy-haired Seamus Finnegan interrupted. Nearly headless? How can you be nearly headless? Sir Nicholas looked extremely miffed, as if their little chat wasn't going at all the way he wanted. Like this, he said irritably. He seized his left ear and pulled. His whole head swung off his neck and fell onto his shoulder as if it was on a hinge. Someone had obviously tried to behead him, but not done it properly. Looking pleased at the stunned looks on their faces, nearly. Headless Nick flipped his head back onto his neck, coughed, and said. So new Gryffindors. I hope you're going to help us win the house. Championship this year? Gryffindors have never gone so long without. Winning. Slytherins have got the cup six years in a row. The bloody. Baron's becoming almost unbearable he's the Slytherin ghost. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a horrible ghost. Sitting there, with blank staring eyes, a gaunt face, and robes stained. With silver blood. He was right next to Malfoy who, Harry was pleased to. See, didn't look too pleased with the seating arrangements. How did he get covered in blood, asked Seamus with great interest. I've never asked, said nearly headless Nick delicately. When everyone had eaten as much as they could, the remains of the food faded from the plates, leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment. Later the desserts appeared. Blocks of ice cream in every flavor you could think of, apple pies, treacle tarts, chocolate eclairs and jam. Donuts, trifle, strawberries, jello, rice pudding. As Harry helped himself to a treacle tart, the talk turned to their families. I'm half and half, said Seamus. Me dad's a muggle. Mom didn't tell him she was a witch till after they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville, said Ron. Well, my gran brought me up and she's a witch, said Neville, but they Family thought I was all muggle for ages. My great uncle Algy kept trying to catch me off my guard and force some magic out of me. He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once, I nearly drowned but nothing happened until I was eight. Great uncle Algy came round for dinner, and he was hanging me out of an upstairs window by the ankles. When my great auntie Enid offered him a meringue and he accidentally let go but I bounced all the way down the garden and into the road. They were all really pleased, Gran was crying, she was so happy. And you should have seen their faces when I got in here they thought I might not be magic enough to come, you see. Great Uncle Algy was so pleased. He bought me my toad. On Harry's other side, Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they start right away, there's so much to learn, I'm particularly interested in transfiguration, you know, turning something into something else, of course, it's supposed to be very difficult. You'll be starting small, just matches into needles and that sort of thing. Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, a hooked nose, and sallow skin. It happened very suddenly. The hook-nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban straight into Harry's eyes and a sharp, hot pain shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. Ouch. Harry clapped a hand to his head. What is it? asked Percy. And nothing. The pain had gone as quickly as it had come. Harder to shake off was the feeling Harry had gotten from the teacher's look a feeling that he didn't like Harry at all. Who's that teacher talking to Professor Quirrell? he asked Percy. Oh, 
you know Quirrell already, do you? No wonder he's looking so nervous, that's Professor Snape. He teaches potions, but he doesn't want to everyone knows he's after Quirrell's job. Knows an awful lot about the dark arts, Snape. Harry watched Snape for a while, but Snape didn't look at him again. At last, the desserts too disappeared, and Professor Dumbledore got to his feet again. The hall fell silent. Ahern just a few more words now that we are all fed and watered. I have a few start-of-term notices to give you. First years should note that the forest on the grounds is forbidden to all pupils. And a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's twinkling eyes flashed in the direction of the Weasley. Twins. I have also been asked by Mr. Filch, the caretaker, to remind you all that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of the term. Anyone interested in playing for their house teams should contact Madame Hooch. And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. Harry laughed, but he was one of the few who did. He's not serious, he muttered to Percy. Must be, said Percy, frowning at Dumbledore. It's odd because he usually gives us a reason why we're not allowed to go somewhere they forests full of dangerous beasts, everyone knows that. I do think he might have told us prefects, at least. And now, before we go to bed, let us sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. Harry noticed that the other teacher's smiles had become rather fixed. Dumbledore gave his wand a little flick, as if he was trying to get a fly off the end, and a long golden ribbon flew out of it, which rose high above the tables and twisted itself, snake-like, into words. Everyone pick their favorite tune, said Dumbledore, and off we go. And the school bellowed. Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Warty Hogwarts. Teach us something please. Whether we be old and bald, or young with scabby knees, our heads could do with filling. With some interesting stuff. For now they're bare and full of air. Dead flies and bits of fluff. So teach us things worth knowing. Bring back what we've forgot. Just do your best, we'll do the rest. And learn until our brains all rot. Everybody finished the song at different times. At last, only the Weasley twins were left singing along to a very slow funeral march. Dumbledore conducted their last few lines with his wand and when they had finished, he was one of those who clapped loudest. Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes. A magic beyond all we do here. And now, bedtime. Off you trot. The Greyfinder first years followed Percy through the chattering crowds. Out of the great hall, and up the marble staircase. Harry's legs were like lead again, but only because he was so tired and full of food. He was too sleepy even to be surprised that the people in the portraits along the corridors whispered and pointed as they passed, or that twice. Percy led them through doorways hidden behind sliding panels and hanging tapestries. They climbed more staircases, yawning and dragging their feet, and Harry was just wondering how much farther they had to go when they came to a sudden halt. A bundle of walking sticks was floating in midair ahead of them, and as Percy took a step toward them they started throwing themselves at him. Peeves, Percy whispered to the first years. A poltergeist. He raised his voice, Peeves show yourself. A loud, rude sound, like the air being let out of a balloon, answered. Do you want me to go to the bloody baron? There was a pop, and a little man with wicked, dark eyes and a wide mouth appeared, floating cross-legged in the air, clutching the walking sticks. Oh, he said, with an evil cackle. Ickle first ties. 
what fun! He swooped suddenly at them. They all ducked. Go away, Peeves, or the Baron will hear about this, I mean it, barked. Percy. Peeves stuck out his tongue and vanished, dropping the walking sticks on. Neville's head. They heard him zooming away, rattling coats of armor as. He passed. You want to watch out for Peeves, said Percy, as they set off again. The bloody Baron's the only one who can control him, he won't even. Listen to us prefects. Here we are. At the very end of the corridor hung a portrait of a very fat woman in a pink silk dress. Password, she said. Capet Draconis, said Percy, and the portrait swung forward to reveal a round hole in the wall. They all scrambled. Through it Neville needed a leg up and found themselves in the Greyfinder common room, a cozy, round room full of squashy armchairs. Percy directed the girls through one door to their dormitory and the boys through another. At the top of a spiral staircase they were. Obviously in one of the towers they found their beds at last, five. Four posters hung with deep red, velvet curtains. Their trunks had already been brought up. Too tired to talk much, they pulled on their pajamas and fell into bed. Great food, isn't it? Ron muttered to Harry through the hangings. Get off, scabbers. He's chewing my sheets. Harry was going to ask Ron if he'd had any of the treacle tart, but he fell asleep almost at once. Perhaps Harry had eaten a bit too much because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him, telling him he must transfer to Slytherin at once, because it was his destiny. Harry told the turban he didn't want to be in Slytherin, it got heavier and heavier, he tried to pull it off but it tightened painfully and there was Malfoy, laughing at him as he struggled with it then Malfoy turned into the hook-nosed teacher, Snape, whose laugh became high and cold there was a burst of green light and Harry woke, sweating and shaking. He rolled over and fell asleep again, and when he woke next day, he didn't remember the dream at all. Chapter 8 The Potions Master There, look. Where? Next to the tall kid with the red hair. Wearing the glasses. Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? Whispers followed Harry from the moment he left his dormitory the next day. People lining up outside classrooms stood on tiptoe to get a look at him, or doubled back to pass him in the corridors again, staring. Harry wished they wouldn't, because he was trying to concentrate on finding his way to classes. There were a hundred and forty-two staircases at Hogwarts, wide. Sweeping ones, narrow, rickety ones, some that led somewhere different. On a Friday, some with a vanishing step halfway up that you had to. Remember to jump. Then there were doors that wouldn't open unless you. Asked politely, or tickled them in exactly the right place, and doors. That weren't really doors at all, but solid walls just pretending. It was also very hard to remember where anything was, because it all seemed to move around a lot. The people in the portraits kept going to visit each other, and Harry was sure the coats of armor could walk. The ghosts didn't help, either. It was always a nasty shock when one of them glided suddenly through a door you were trying to open. Nearly. Headless Nick was always happy to point new Gryffindors in the right direction, but Peeves the poltergeist was worth two locked doors and a trick staircase if you met him when you were late for class. He would drop waste paper baskets on your head, pull rugs from under your feet, pelt you with bits of chalk, or sneak up behind you, invisible, grab your nose, and screech, got your conch. Even worse than Peeves, if that was possible, was the caretaker, Argus. Filch. Harry and Ron managed to get on the wrong side of him on their very first morning. 
Filch found them trying to force their way through a door that unluckily turned out to be the entrance to the Out of Bounds corridor on the third floor. He wouldn't believe they were lost, was sure they were trying to break into it on purpose, and was threatening to lock them in the dungeons when they were rescued by Professor Quirrell, who was passing. Filch owned a cat called Mrs. Norris, a scrawny, dust-colored creature with bulging, lamp-like eyes just like Filch's. She patrolled the corridors alone. Break a rule in front of her, put just one toe out of line, and she'd whisk off for Filch, who'd appear, wheezing, two seconds later. Filch knew the secret passageways of the school better than anyone, except perhaps the Weasley twins, and could pop up as suddenly as any of the ghosts. The students all hated him, and it was the dearest ambition of many to give Mrs. Norris a good kick. And then, once you had managed to find them, there were the classes themselves. There was a lot more to magic, as Harry quickly found out. Then waving your wand and saying a few funny words. They had to study the night skies through their telescopes every Wednesday at midnight and learn the names of different stars in the movements of the planets. Three times a week they went out to the greenhouses behind the castle to study herbology, with a dumpy little which called Professor Sprout, where they learned how to take care of all the strange plants and fungi, and found out what they were used for. Easily the most boring class was History of Magic, which was the only one taught by a ghost. Professor Bins had been very old. Indeed when he had fallen asleep in front of the staff room fire and got up next morning to teach, leaving his body behind him. Bins droned on and on while they scribbled down names and dates, and got emetic they evil and uric the oddball mixed up. Professor Flitwick, the charms teacher, was a tiny little wizard who had to stand on a pile of books to see over his desk. At the start of their First class he took the roll call, and when he reached Harry's name he gave an excited squeak and toppled out of sight. Professor McGonagall was again different. Harry had been quite right to think she wasn't a teacher to cross. Strict and clever, she gave them a talking to the moment they sat down in her first class. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts, she said. Anyone messing around in my class? will leave and not come back. You have been warned. Then she changed her desk into a pig and back again. They were all very impressed and couldn't wait to get started, but soon realized they weren't going to be changing the furniture into animals for a long time. After taking a lot of complicated notes, they were each given a match and started trying to turn it into a needle. By the end of the lesson, only Hermione Granger had made any difference to her match, Professor. McGonagall showed the class how it had gone all silver and pointy and gave Hermione a rare smile. The class everyone had really been looking forward to was defense against the dark arts, but Quirrell's lessons turned out to be a bit of a joke. His classroom smelled strongly of garlic, which everyone said was to ward off a vampire he'd met in Romania and was afraid would be coming back to get him one of these days. His turban, he told them, had been given to him by an African prince as a thank you for getting rid of a troublesome zombie, but they weren't sure they believed this story. For one thing, when Seamus Finnegan asked eagerly to hear how Quirrell had fought off the zombie, Quirrell went pink and started talking about the weather, for another, they had noticed that a funny smell hung around the turban, and the Weasley twins insisted that it was stuffed full of garlic as well, so that Quirrell was protected wherever he went. Harry was very relieved to find out that he wasn't miles behind everyone else. Lots of people had come from Muggle families and, like him, hadn't had any idea that they were witches and wizards. There was so much to 
learn that even people like Ron didn't have much of a head start. Friday was an important day for Harry and Ron. They finally managed to find their way down to the Great Hall for breakfast without getting lost. Once. What have we got today? Harry asked Ron as he poured sugar on his porridge. Double potions with the Slytherins, said Ron. Snape's head of Slytherin House. They say he always favors them we'll be able to see. If it's true. Wish McGonagall favored us, said Harry. Professor McGonagall was head of Gryffindor House, but it hadn't stopped her from giving them a huge pile of homework the day before. Just then, the mail arrived. Harry had gotten used to this by now, but it had given him a bit of a shock on the first morning, when about a hundred owls had suddenly streamed into the Great Hall during breakfast, circling the tables until they saw their owners, and dropping letters and packages onto their laps. Hedwig hadn't brought Harry anything so far. She sometimes flew in to nibble his ear and have a bit of toast before going off to sleep in the Olary with the other school owls. This morning, however, she fluttered down between the marmalade and the sugar bowl and dropped a note onto Harry's plate. Harry tore it open at once. It said, in a very untidy scrawl. Dear Harry, I know you get Friday afternoons off, so would you like to come and have a cup of tea with me around three? I want to hear all about your first week. Send us an answer back with Hedwig. Hagrid. Harry borrowed Ron's quill, scribbled yes, please, see you later on the back of the note, and sent Hedwig off again. It was lucky that Harry had tea with Hagrid to look forward to, because the potion's lesson turned out to be the worst thing that had happened to him so far. At the start of term banquet, Harry had gotten the idea that Professor Snape disliked him. By the end of the first potions lesson, he knew he'd been wrong. Snape didn't dislike Harry he hated him. Potions lessons took place down in one of the dungeons. It was colder here than up in the main castle, and would have been quite creepy enough. Without the pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Snape, like Flitwick, started the class by taking the roll call, and like Flitwick, he paused at Harry's name. Ah, yes, he said softly, Harry Potter. Our new celebrity. Draco Malfoy and his friends Crab and Goyle sniggered behind they. Hands. Snape finished calling the names and looked up at the class. His. Eyes were black like Hagrid's, but they had none of Hagrid's warmth. They were cold and empty and made you think of dark tunnels. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of. Potion making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but. They caught every word like Professor McGonagall, Snape had why caught. Every word like Professor McGonagall, Snape had the gift of keeping a. Class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving. Here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you. Will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with. Its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through. Human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach. You how to bottle fame, brew glory even stop or death if you aren't. As big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. More silence followed this little speech. Harry and Ron exchanged looks. With raised eyebrows. Hermione Granger was on the edge of her seat and looked desperate to start proving that she wasn't a dunderhead. Potter, said Snape suddenly. What would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Powdered root of what to an infusion of what? Harry glanced at Ron, who looked as stumped as he was, Hermione's hand had shot into the air. I don't know, sit, said Harry. Snape's lips curled into a sneer. Tut, 
Tut fame clearly isn't everything. He ignored Hermione's hand. Let's try again. Potter, where would you look if I told you to find me? Abizor. Hermione stretched her hand as high into the air as it would go without. Her leaving her seat, but Harry didn't have the faintest idea what a Bezor was. He tried not to look at Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, who were shaking with laughter. I don't know, sit. Thought you wouldn't open a book before coming. Eh, Potter. Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes. He had looked through his books at the Disleys, but did Snape expect him to remember everything in 1,000 magical herbs? And fungi? Snape was still ignoring Hermione's quivering hand. What is the difference, Potter, between Monk's Hood and Wolfsbane? At this, Hermione stood up, her hand stretching toward the dungeon. Ceiling. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does though, why? Don't you try her? A few people laughed, Harry caught Seamus's eye, and Seamus winked. Snape, however, was not pleased. Sit down, he snapped at Hermione. For your information, Potter. Asphodel and Wormwood make a sleeping potion so powerful it is known as the draft of living death. A bezoar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat and it will save you from most poisons. As for monkshood and wolfsbane, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name of aconite. Well? Why aren't you all copying that down? There was a sudden rummaging for quills and parchment. Over the noise. Snape said, and a point will be taken from Gryffindor House for your cheek, Potter. Things didn't improve for the Gryffindors as the potion's lesson continued. Snape put them all into pairs and set them to mixing up a simple potion to cure boils. He swept around in his long black cloak, watching them weigh dried nettles and crush snake fangs, criticizing almost everyone except Malfoy, whom he seemed to like. He was just telling everyone to look at the perfect way Malfoy had stewed his horned. Slugs when clouds of acid green smoke and a loud hissing filled the dungeon. Neville had somehow managed to melt Seamus's cauldron into a twisted blob, and their potion was seeping across the stone floor, burning holes in people's shoes. Within seconds, the whole class was standing on their stools while Neville, who had been drenched in the potion when the cauldron collapsed, moaned in pain as angry red boils sprang up all over his arms and legs. Idiot boy, snarled Snape, clearing the spilled potion away with one wave of his wand. I suppose you added the porcupine quills before taking the cauldron off the fire. Neville whimpered as boils started to pop up all over his nose. Take him up to the hospital wing, Snape spat at Seamus. Then he rounded on Harry and Ron, who had been working next to Neville. You Potter why didn't you tell him not to add the quills? Thought. He'd make you look good if he got it wrong, did you? That's another. Point you've lost for Gryffindor. This was so unfair that Harry opened his mouth to argue, but Ron kicked. Him behind their cauldron. Doi asterisk push it, he muttered, I've heard Snape can turn very nasty. As they climbed the steps out of the dungeon an hour later, Harry's mind was racing and his spirits were low. He'd lost two points for Gryffindor. In his very first week why did Snape hate him so much? Cheer up! Said Ron, Snape's always taking points off Fred and George. Can I come? And meet Hagrid with you? At five to three they left the castle and made their way across the grounds. Hagrid lived in a small wooden house on the edge of the Forbidden Forest. A crossbow and a pair of galoshes were outside the front door. When Harry knocked they heard a frantic scrabbling from inside and several booming barks. Then Hagrid's voice rang out, saying, Back, Fang. Back. Hagrid's big, 
hairy face appeared in the crack as he pulled the door. Open. Hang on, he said. Back, Fang. He let them in, struggling to keep a hold on the collar of an enormous black boar hound. There was only one room inside. Hams and pheasants were hanging from the ceiling, a copper kettle was boiling on the open fire, and in the corner stood a massive bed with a patchwork quilt over it. Make yourselves at home, said Hagrid, letting go of Fang, who bounded straight at Ron and started licking his ears. Like Hagrid, Fang was clearly not as fierce as he looked. This is Ron, Harry told Hagrid, who was pouring boiling water into a large teapot and putting rock cakes onto a plate. Another Weasley, eh, said Hagrid, glancing at Ron's freckles. I spent half me life chassin' your twin brothers away from the forest. The rock cakes were shapeless lumps with raisins that almost broke there teeth, but Harry and Ron pretended to be enjoying them as they told Hagrid all about their first lessons. Fang rested his head on Harry's knee and drooled all over his robes. Harry and Ron were delighted to hear Hagrid call Fitch that old git. And as for that cat, Mrs. Norris, I'd like to introduce her to Fang. Sometime. Do you know, every time I go up to the school, she follows me. Everywhere? Can't get rid of her Fitch puts her up to it. Harry told Hagrid about Snape's lesson. Hagrid, like Ron, told Harry not to worry about it, that Snape liked hardly any of the students. But he seemed to really hate me. Rubbish, said Hagrid. Why should he? Yet Harry couldn't help thinking that Hagrid didn't quite meet his eyes. When he said that. How's your brother Charlie? Hagrid asked Ron. I liked him a lot. Great with animals. Harry wondered if Hagrid had changed the subject on purpose. While Ron told Hagrid all about Charlie's work with dragons, Harry picked up a piece of paper that was lying on the table under the tea cozy. It was a cutting from the Daily Prophet. Gringotts break in latest. Investigations continue into the break-in at Gringotts on July 31st. Widely believed to be the work of dark wizards or witches unknown. Gringotts goblins today insisted that nothing had been taken. The vault that was searched had in fact been emptied the same day. But we're not telling you what was in there, so keep your noses out if you know what's good for you, said a Gringotts spokesgoblin this afternoon. Harry remembered Ron telling him on the train that someone had tried to rob Gringotts, but Ron hadn't mentioned the date. Hagrid, said Harry, that Gringotts break-in happened on my birthday. It might have been happening while we were there. There was no doubt about it, Hagrid definitely didn't meet Harry's eyes. This time, he grunted and offered him another rock cake. Harry read the story again. The vault that was searched had in fact been emptied. Earlier that same day, Hagrid had emptied Vault 700 and 13, if you could call it emptying, taking out that grubby little package. Had that been what the thieves were looking for? As Harry and Ron walked back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed down with rock cakes they'd been too polite to refuse, Harry thought that none of the lessons he'd had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package? Just in time? Where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? Chapter 9 The Midnight Duel Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley. But that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year. Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much. Or at least, they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room that made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly. Just what I always wanted. To make a fool. 
of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know that you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron. Reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy's always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting on the house Quidditch teams and told long boastful stories that always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though, the way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen. About the time he'd almost hit a hang glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory about soccer. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game. With only one ball where no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron. Prodding Dean's poster of West Ham soccer team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life, because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd had good reason, because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of Accidents even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of a book not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday she bored them all stupid with flying tips she'd gotten out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for Anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later, but everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the mail. Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a remembral, he explained. Gran knows I forget things this. Tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it. Tight like this and if it turns red oh. His face fell, because they. Remembral had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Greyfinder table, snatched the Remembral out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy, but Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my remembral, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the remembral back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he sloped away with Crab and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps onto the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns toward a smooth, flat lawn. On the opposite side of the grounds to the forbidden forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to Vibrate if you flew too high, or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short, grey hair, and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you all waiting for, she barked. Everyone stand by. Broomstick. Come on, 
hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old and some of the twigs stuck. Out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at the front, and say up. UPF everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few. That did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground, and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell. When you were afraid, thought Harry, there was a quaver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it. Wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground, hard, said. Madam Hooch. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet, and then come. Straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle three. Two dash. But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madam Hooch's lips. Come back, boy, she shouted but Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle 12 feet 20 feet. Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground falling away, saw him gasp, slip sideways off the broom end. Whamma thud in a nasty crack and Neville lay face down on the grass. In a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher, and started to drift lazily toward the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy it's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You. Leave those brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before. You can say quid ditch. Come on, dear. Neville his face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face, the great lump? The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Parvati Paddle. Ooh, sticking up for long bottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like fat little crybabies. Parvati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The rememberal glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking. To watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to find how about. Up a tree. Give it here. Harry yelled, but Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick. And taken off. He hadn't been lying, he could fly well. Hovering level. With the topmost branches of an oak he called, come and get it. Potter. Harry grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madame Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom. And kicked hard against the ground and up, up he soared, air rushed. Through his hair, and his robes whipped out behind him and in a rush of. Fierce joy he realized he'd found something he could do without being. Taught this was easy, this was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up, a little to take it even higher, and heard screams and gasps of girls. Back on the ground and an admiring hoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked. Stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh. Yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but looking worried. Harry knew somehow, what to do. 
He leaned forward and grasped the broom. Tightly in both hands, and it shot toward Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy. Only just got out of the way in time, Harry made a sharp about face and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crab and goyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted, and he threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back toward the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with the screams of people. Watching he stretched out his hand a foot from the ground he caught it, just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass with the rememberal clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter. His heart sank faster than he'd just dived. Professor McGonagall was running toward them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never in all my time at Hogwarts Dash. Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses flashed furiously, Dash how dare you might have broken your neck Dash. It wasn't his fault, Professor Dash. Be quiet, Miss Paddle. But Malfoy Dash. That's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me, now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode toward the castle. He was going to be expelled, he just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong. With his voice, Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him, he had to jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd be packing his bags in ten minutes. What? Would the Dursleys say when he turned up on the doorstep? Up the front steps, up the marble staircase inside, and still Professor. McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open doors and marched. Along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was. Taking him to Dumbledore. He thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to. Stay on as gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others becoming wizards, while he stumped around the grounds carrying Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick, could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood? Thought Harry, bewildered was wood a cane she was going to use on him? But wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Flitwickle's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched on up the corridor, wood looking curiously at Harry. In here, Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom that was empty except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood I've found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boy's a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be being expelled, and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught that thing in his hand after a fifty-foot dive, Professor. McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. 
Charlie Weasley. Couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter, he asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a seeker, too, said Wood, now walking around. Harry and staring at him. Lightspeedy will have to get him a decent broom, Professor Animbus 2000 or a clean sweep 7. I'd say. I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows, we need a better team than last year. Flattened in that last match by Slytherin, I couldn't look Severus Snape in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened. When he'd left the grounds with Professor McGonagall, Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said. But first years never you must be the youngest. House player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone, Wood. Wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the Team Two Beaters. I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year. Said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry, Wood was almost skipping. When he told us. Anyway, we've got to go. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passageway out of the school. Bet it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Smarmy that we found in our first week. See you. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up, Malfoy, flanked by Crab and Goyle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you getting the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now that you're back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was of course nothing at all little about Crab and Goyle, but as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I'd take you on any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want. Wizard's Duel Wands only no contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard's duel before, I suppose. Of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second, who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight all right? We'll meet you in the trophy room, that's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel, said Harry. And what do you mean, you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually. Getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels, you know. With real wizards. The most you and Malfoy'll be able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse, anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away and punch him on the nose, Ron suggested. Excuse me. 
They both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. Can't a person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying Dash. Bet you could, Ron muttered. Dash and you mustn't go wandering around the school at night, think of the points you'll lose Greyfinder if you're caught, and you're bound to be. It's really very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end to the day. Harry thought, as he lay awake much later listening to Dean and Seamus. Falling asleep, Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice such as if he tries to curse you. You'd better dodge it, because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch or Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming. Up out of the darkness, this was his big chance to beat Malfoy. Face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last, we'd better go. They pulled on their bathrobes, picked up their wands, and crept across. The tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Greyfinder. Common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning. All the armchairs into hunched black shadows. They had almost reached. The portrait hole when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them, I can't believe you are going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink bathrobe. And a frown. You, said Ron furiously. Go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped, Percy he's a prefect, he'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady. And climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through. The portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Greyfinder, do you only care about yourselves, I? Don't want Slytherin to win the House Cup and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you, you just remember what I said. When you're on the train home tomorrow, you're so dash. But what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit and Hermione was locked out of Greyfinder Tower. Now what am I going to do, she asked shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go, we three re going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand out here and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us I'll tell him the truth, that I was trying to stop you, and you can back me up. You've got some nerve dash said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of snuffling. Mrs. Norris, breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor. Fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours, I couldn't. Remember the new password to get into bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's pig snout but it won't. Help you now, the fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm, said Harry. Fine said Neville, showing them. Madame Pomfrey mended it in about a minute. Good, well, look, Neville, we've got to be somewhere, we'll see you. Later Dash. 
Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet, I don't want to. Stay here alone, the bloody baron's been passed twice already. Ron looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned that. Curse of the bogies Quirrell told us about, and used it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the Curse of the bogies, but Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along corridors striped with bars of moonlight from the high windows. At every turn Harry expected to run into Filch or M.R.S. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a staircase to the third floor. And tiptoed toward the trophy room. Malfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy cases glimmered. Where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates, and statues. Winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the walls. Keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late, maybe he's chickened out, Ron whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak and it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet, they might be lurking in a corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror struck, Harry waved madly. At the other three to follow him as quickly as possible, they scurried. Silently toward the door, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped round the corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way. Harry mouthed to the others and, petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch. Getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke. Into a run he tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch was following they swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor then another, Harry in the lead. Without any idea where they were or where they were going they ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtled along it and came out near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and spluttering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Greyfinder Tower, said Ron quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room, Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of a classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves please you'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Wandering around at midnight, Ickle first ties. Tut, tut, tut. Naughty. Naughty, you'll get caughty. Not if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Should tell Filch, I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves this was a big mistake. Students out of bed. Peeves bellowed, students out of bed. Down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, 
they ran for their lives, right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door and it was locked. This is it. Ron moaned, as they pushed helplessly at the door, we're done for. This is the end. They could hear footsteps, Filch running as fast as he could toward Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora. The lock clicked and the door swung open they piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they go, Peeves? Filch was saying. Quick, tell me. Say please. Don't mess with me, Peeves, now where did they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right please. Nothing. Ha 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 ha. Told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say. Please. Ha ha. Hey 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 hey. And they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing. Away and Filch cursing in rage. He thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville. For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's bathrobe for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw, quite clearly, what? For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare this was too much, on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room, as he had supposed. They were in a corridor. They forbidden corridor on the third floor. And now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog that filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads. Three pairs of rolling, mad eyes, three noses, twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise, but it was quickly getting over that, there was no mistaking what those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob between Filch and Death, he'd take Filch. They fell backward Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran, they almost flew, back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else, because they didn't see him anywhere, but they hardly cared all they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you all been, she asked, looking at their bathrobes hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that pig snout. Pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling, into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as if he'd never speak again. What do they think they're doing, keeping a thing like that locked up? In a school, said Ron finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you, she snapped. Didn't you see what it was standing on? The floor. Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet, I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trapdoor. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could all have been killed. Or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You'd think we dragged her along. Wouldn't you? 
but Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back into bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something you wanted to hide except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby Liddy package from Vault 713 was.